numbered among you. Um, this morning, if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, which is the third book in the New Testament. The book of Luke, we're going to be in the 10th chapter. If you've got your device, it's totally cool if you open that up and get download a Bible app and read it. You've got to put the Word of God in you when you don't need it, so it'll be there when you do need it. We believe in the Word here at Cambridge, and in and, and, and friendship, we stand on the Word. And so, uh, very thankful for all of you who bring your Bibles. I think it's great. I heard Rod Parsley, a preacher, one time say that, look at the man whose Bible is worn out, and you'll see that his soul is not. Uh, right before I get into the message, though, I want to take just a moment of personal privilege. If you are praying and, in, and are in need of a friend, I just want you to know that God hears that. If you're praying right now, God, I need friends. I need friends. The Lord will hear that. And I don't want you to get discouraged if it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, there was a time in my life where my wife and I, we were, we were called by the Lord to move to uh, a different city, uh, a larger city in Birmingham in 2011. And I admit to you that we did not want to. <laughs> it was a struggle. Who wants to move to Birmingham? When you, I mean, when you live in Limestone County. Um, and, and, but, but it was the Lord that, that put it on our heart. But when we got there, you know, it's, it's always uh, a little anxiety in, in, in your mind to think where, you know, who, I'm, I've left all my people behind. Where am I going to find friends? And so you pray, God, please, please, please place people in your life that just will, will help you. And I, I want to testify that God hears that prayer. And uh, my friends, James and Stephanie Kern, are here somewhere. I'm not going to make them there. They, they just raised their hand anyway. Uh, when, when we moved to Birmingham, I met uh, James and Stephanie and immediately just knew that this is a guy that's going to sharpen me. And in some of the worst moments of my life, this brother, James, uh, gave me encouragement and kept my sanity from going off the rails and kicked my butt a couple of times in a good way. And so I, I love both of you. You guys are awesome. We honor you. And I just want to say that we're glad you're there. Just visiting. They came up to hear Lauren Dangle and decided to come over here and see us as well. So I just, I love you guys. Just want to publicly honor you. So welcome to Cambridge. All right. In 2003, I had the opportunity to go to Romania uh, on a mission trip uh, with a, a large group of young adults, and uh, it was a ministry that um, had worship team and uh, dance teams and preaching teams, and we went through the entire country for two weeks in large cities putting on crusades uh, where uh, we would show up and the sound company had already put up a large stage and sound system in a public area, maybe the, the town square and the church had been involved for weeks advertising this event. And, and we would do these crusades. And it was, a, it was a really neat opportunity. And I got to go as a musician in the worship team and uh, uh, just had a, a really good experience. Uh, the country is glorious. It's beautiful. There's beautiful art there and architecture and the people are friendly and the food is great. It's, it's a beautiful country. Uh, but there are several things that, that made an impact on me that I will never forget. Uh, when I, when I grew up as a kid, uh, the only reference I'd ever had to gypsies uh, was a negative light. Uh, all of the movies that I saw, any time that a gypsy was depicted, it was always somebody who was a swindler or a pickpocket or somebody who dealt with you know, witchcraft or something like that, put hexes on you. So it wasn't ever a good thing. Um, and and when, I, when we were in Romania, um, we would... We would mainly stay in buses traveling from one city to another, but whenever we had downtime, our guides would take us on tours of the city that we had go, gone into to see you know, old churches or, or different, different historical landmarks. But there was a certain day when we went into the capital, and uh, they told us, you know, whatever you do when we're walking around, if a child goes up to you, uh, do not interact with the child. Don't look at the child. Don't talk to the child. Don't give the child anything. Act like the child doesn't exist and ignore it. Which I thought, that doesn't sound good at all. Um, and these were our Christian tour guides that were telling us to do this uh, because the children were gypsy children. And they said that these children are, you know, ordered by their parents or whoever their handlers are 
uh, to go up to you know people and beg for money, and then if they get money, then they'll take that money and give it to their handler or give it to their parent, and then the parent will send them right back out. They said, just don't don't give them anything, don't acknowledge them, don't talk to them, and that was extremely difficult for me because growing up in Alabama, and I grew up in Lauderdale County. I mean, the, we don't see beggars. We don't see kids begging on the street. We certainly don't see parents sending their children. And I'm talking like six, seven years old, sometimes younger, up to you and, and begging for food or, or money. Uh, in, in Romania, gypsies are considered second class, third class citizens. They are stigmatized. They are not enjoyed. They're, they're, they're not appreciated as, as humans. Uh, we saw them on the street. They were begging for money. Um, it was a very difficult, very difficult moment for us. Um, the cities were glorious. They were beautiful, just like they had all of the, the same amenities that we have. And we, there were several of us who, who wanted to go see where the gypsies lived. And so we made a request, and so uh, our guides obliged that request, and they took us outside of the city where the roads went from asphalt to broken asphalt to gravel to dirt and we found ourselves in a village a village that had a single power line that went in and supplied electricity but that was the only social service that they had inside their village were mainly one room cinder block dwellings with a stove inside that's how they got their heat and uh, their their streets were full of animals where there was waste everywhere and uh, it was a it was a, a bleak way to live um, we stayed there for a little bit of time we tried to exchange as many smiles as we could we told them the purpose that we were there was to tell them that Jesus loves them and witness our faith to them and to ask if we could pray for them uh, and when we left that place we didn't change their life in the physical in any way we didn't make their physical lives better we didn't bless them with with any means of, to, to live better other than telling them about Christ, which is the greatest thing you can tell them, but we didn't, ch you know, we didn't change their life in, in a physical way. But I and my fellow uh, people on, on this trip, at the end of the trip, we got on our plane, we flew home, we drove our cars to our houses, we got into our warm beds, and our life didn't didn't look at all like those people, these outcasts. Um, but I left with my heart changed because I had not encountered that kind of situation before. I want to share with you a social experiment, a video that was made by UNICEF. And in Europe, this is a big problem with people being indifferent. In this video, a young girl, with the permission of her parents, of course, and some, some security and some people, a young girl is placed in a, uh, a busy part of the city. In one moment, she is dressed very, very nice, very clean, very presentable. And in a second moment, she is presented with dirty clothes, dirty hair, dirty face to see the different kind of reactions that human beings will make. I'd like you to look at it.
That's a very difficult video to watch, isn't it? Because the value of the young girl cannot be measured by what she's wearing, is it? value of the young girl in that video has nothing to do with what she wore or what she looked like. And yet, we as human beings suffer from indifference. We suffer from it in a big way. Indifference is having, with, it's, it's without interest or concern. It's not caring it's being apathetic. That's what indifference is. It's also having no bias, having no prejudice, no preference, impartial or disinterested. It's just not caring, not caring at all. Indifference is a poison. That's what it is. It is a poison. Once it's entered your mind, it begins to cloud your view of God's creation. When indifference creeps down into your heart, it produces callousness. And callousness will enable you to ignore God's given opportunity that is right in front of you to make a positive change in the world. Indifference speaks to us in very familiar voices. And I say speaks to us because everything is spiritual. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and, power, powers and dominions of, of spiritual evil. And wickedness. And so when I say speaks, I'm talking about demonic entities that say to us, you don't have time for that. That say to us, someone else is going to come along. That say to us, this is going to mess up your plans and your schedule. That say to us, I could care less about anything right now except for me. These are the whispers that indifference sounds like. Indifference is the driving force in our hearts that causes us to look away with apathetic disinterest when a need is directly in front of us. That's what indifference is. And Jesus speaks in stories. He tells parables, words that everyone can understand in their related topics. And once he was questioned what are the greatest commandments? His answer was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is likening unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. The person who asked that question said, well, then who, who is my neighbor? Define for me my neighbor. And this was Jesus' reply, Luke 10, chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse, starting in verse 30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. It's a very familiar story. Jesus did not have to explain to the listeners of that culture in his day the details of the story because they were Jewish, they knew. But I want to help us understand for those who, who need the context. The man who was robbed is a Jewish man. Because he is Jewish, as a son of Abraham, he is deserved common respect and decency among his countrymen. Jewish, uh, Jewish people in the kingdom at this time were extreme nationalists. They, they took care of their own. 
The priest was a Jewish man. He was well-educated. He was well-respected in his community, and he had means to help. The Levite was the best of the best of the best educated, was well-respected in his community, and had the means to also help. Both of these men are plagued with indifference. And the Samaritan... The Samaritan people were considered second-class or third-class scum of the earth. Uh, Jewish people would not, do, would not intermarry with them. They would not eat with them. They would not walk on the side of, same side of the street with them. Many historians will tell us that when Jews would travel, they would go around the areas that they live, adding days sometimes to their journey instead of going through a shortcut through the Samaritan town. That's how much they did not like them at all. But the Samaritan in this story has the most valuable commodity. He has compassion. Compassion. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now remember, if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus did rise from the dead, if he is King of kings and Lord of lords, ruler of everything, then everything that Jesus says is absolute truth, and we must submit to it as followers. And so when Jesus says, go and do, he is not a asking a suggestion. He is not presenting an option. He is telling his followers, if you follow me, go and do likewise. It is not optional. And we're going to look at another place where Jesus talks about it not being optional. It's easy for us to be moved when we see a video like we just watched when it comes to children. It's easy for us to have compassion about children, and that is the way it should be. However, I will pose this question to you. What about adults? Because I don't have a problem having the kid, but if there's an adult that can do better for themselves and just choose not to, and they look run down and ragged, and they don't look like me, and they don't act like me, they don't smell like me, they don't wear clothes like me, are they just as valuable and worthy and deserving of my help as the little child? They are. However, I suffer from indifference in many, many occasions. And I think this is a bigger problem that we want to admit. This week, I had a busy schedule, had a lot of things going on. On Thursday, I was trying to get some tasks knocked out because Jovi had a soccer game that afternoon. I wanted to make sure I made it home, got some food in my stomach, and, 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 uh, and got on to a soccer game. I leave work, and I go grab me a sandwich. I get to the rest, uh, drive through restaurant, I get me a hot sandwich. I'm excited about eating this sandwich because I'm hungry. And as I'm sitting in the drive-thru, I look beside me, and on the highway, there's a car broken down, and the hatchback is open. It's not a nice car. It's not a new car. It's a run-down, old, beat-up car. The hatch is open. There's a man sitting in the trunk with his hands on the side, and he's resting in the car, and he's wearing ragged blue jeans, an old T-shirt, and his hair is all the way down to his shoulders, and he just doesn't look like that professional of a guy. And I've got a hot sandwich. And I've got to get back to the church. And I've got to get things done, knock it out so I can get to my daughter's soccer game. And I see him, and I make this sound. Because <sighs> I tell my daughter all the time, I ask her one simple question. What do we do, Jovi? Her reply is, we help. That's what we do. I didn't want to help, though. I wanted to eat a hot sandwich. <laughs> so I would start pulling out of the drive of the uh, drive through and get on, and I'm trying to get on the highway. And as soon as I'm going up to get on the highway, and I'm looking at all the cars past this guy, the Lord drops this parable on my heart. The still small voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will never twist your arm behind you and force you to do anything. He gently, gently speaks to us. And this parable comes up and I realize I have a decision to make. I have to inconvenience myself. I have to mess up my schedule. I don't know what this is going to cost me. I don't know what kind of danger I'm walking into. My sandwich is about to get cold. 
We chuckle about it. Yeah, I'm trying to make light of it. But the reality is that there was a battle of indifference. So I pull in behind him and I just roll down my window and say, hey, man, you all right? He said, well, my transmission is completely gone in my car. I said, well, that stinks for you. <laughs> um, I said, well, that, that's, that's terrible. Can I do anything to help you? And he said, no, man, I've already called a tow truck. They're on the way. I'm good. Thanks for stopping. And I gave a lot. Yes. I said, I your hot sandwich now. And so he was okay. I gave him a God bless. Hope, you, hope everything works out. And I drive off. I didn't, I didn't have to do anything. But it was a moment where I had to submit my heart to the Lord that I will find out. I will stop. I will ask the questions. And wherever it leads, I will be the hands and feet of Jesus so that I can fulfill the will of God for my life in that moment right there. And I'm so glad that I did because guess what? When I drove away, I didn't have shame. I didn't have reg regret. I fulfilled what God wanted me to do. And I got to eat a hot sandwich. But what if I hadn't? Man, I, I, would have, I would have fretted about that for the rest of the day. And I would not have pleased the Lord, which is the main goal of my existence, to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, to love him. And loving him is submitting to him in the things that are inconvenient sometimes. You ever seen a horse downtown being pulled by a carriage? What do they have around their face? I'm not a horse guy, but they've got these things. I don't know. What, what do they call these things? What Blinders. What, why do they put blinders on the horse? Keep them focused so they won't get distracted, so they won't get spooked. That's what indifference is in our lives. Indifference is a blinder set on both sets of our eyes where we will not allow ourselves to see the peripheral of the need in front of us that Christ has positioned us to meet. And what indifference looks like is a person who is so self-absorbed, they don't understand that the need in front of them is actually ministering to Jesus. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. This is Jesus speaking. Here's what he says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, come. You blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. Underline that. Underline I was a stranger. Because that is a massive hiccup for us. If I don't know you, I'm not helping you. I was a stranger, and you took me in. <laughs> I, this is not in my notes, but I remember one when this really got in my heart in my young 20s. I was driving home from work one day. I'd gotten out of Bible college. I was still living with my mom and dad. Cell phones were not a thing. And there was a hitchhiker, a man with gray hair, hitchhiking with a backpack. And I stopped and picked him up and said, where are you going? He said, I don't know. I said, you want some supper? He said, yes. And I said, good. Mama's cooking fried chicken. And I took him to the house. <laughs> I didn't think a thing about it. I got home and there's my mom and dad. We're sitting at the dinner table. It's real quiet <laughs> with stranger man. Took him to the hotel, got him a place to sleep for the night. I don't know if he was an angel or not. I don't know. He got some great fried chicken, and we got to feed Jesus that night. You know, we fed, we had the honor of feeding Jesus in our house. 
I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. If Jesus is king, that means all of his words are eternal truths and cannot be changed. And when he says this, it is concrete. He goes on, though, in 41, he says, Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer and say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison that did not minister to you? Then he will answer and say, Surely I say, inasmuch as you did not do to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is absolute. Hear the words of Christ. Hear him very clearly. When God puts a need in front of you, you are it. There is no backup plan. He has called you to do his work. No matter what it costs you, what the threat is, what the fear is, the inconvenience, the loss of your possessions, the coldness of your sandwich. When we submit to indifference, we step outside of the will of God. And Jesus has emotions. God has feelings. God is happy and God gets angry. God is impressed and God gets disappointed. I want to live on the side that he's impressed. I want to live on the side that where the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did a good job. That's where, I, that's where I want to live. I hope you want to live there too. Indifference is the poison that blinds our eyes from seeing Jesus in the people in front of us that God wants us to serve, help, and to love. That's, that's the blinder. I can't see... God, what you want me to do today because this person doesn't match my criteria of the help. When we are in step with God, though, the fruit of the Spirit drives us to act like Jesus with compassion, with empathy, with love. That is a byproduct of being close to Christ. And when our hearts are harnessed by God, his power is made known to the people affected by our actions. If you have a problem and a fear of witnessing your faith to people, just look for the people that need help. Because it's the easiest thing in the world to give assistance and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm doing this because Jesus loves you. Bam, you've already started preaching the gospel. And that could be the very reason why God has placed them in front of you in the first place. A couple of things for us to think about this morning. A couple of questions I have for you. Number one, are you interested or concerned with what God is interested and concerned with? This is a hard one for us. Because while we may say it in a metaphorical way, it doesn't matter what we say verbally. It is, what matters is what we do. Because if I am interested in what God is interested in, then my actions will follow his interests and not mine. I want to follow his interests. I want to be concerned with what his concerns are, and my concerns are secondary. I had concerns this week that I wasn't going to get done in time. I wouldn't make it home in time, that I would be stressed and strained to get to my daughter's soccer game. And if this guy takes all of my time, what's going to happen? The Lord is not concerned about that. The Lord is concerned about us being the hands and feet of Christ. In what way has having no bias, no prejudice, no preference, which is what indifference is, how has that interfered with God working through you. Because if the Lord has called you over and over and over to feed him, to clothe him, to serve him, and you have refused over and over and over, and he's just stopped asking you to do it, and you're not presented with any opportunities, that's a problem. 
Because if the Lord can't trust you with it, why would he lead you to it? How's that working for you? If God has stopped asking you to serve him, that's a problem. And I do believe that the Lord wants to uproot this in our hearts and expose it to allow us to kill it in our hearts and submit to him. If your relationship with God and your routine is lukewarm and stagnant, what changes can you make today to course correct? Because lukewarm and stagnant doesn't want to help. Lukewarm and stagnant doesn't want to stop. Lukewarm and stagnant doesn't want to give. Lukewarm and stagnant doesn't want to be inconvenienced or certainly help people that don't look like me or don't qualify for my help. That's lukewarm and stagnant. And if that is where we are, what changes will we make today to course correct? Because the Lord is very serious in Matthew chapter 25. It's not a suggestion. Church, I love you. God is king. He's very serious about this. Indifference is the driving force in our hearts that cause us to look away with apathetic disinterest when a need is directly in front of us. And let me just step, let me just step into some waters that are uncomfortable for a moment. Can I do that? Okay. This message isn't just about stopping to help someone in need. It is a whole lot greater than that. Indifference can affect the voice you and I should have in a world that is rapidly changing and moving away from the design and purpose of God. The church cannot be indifferent to social issues that are happening around us. And a lot of times the church has been beaten back into silence and we adopt indifference because we say, let them be them and let's whatever. It's not affecting me, so I'm not, I'm not going to engage at all. Currently right now, our nation is having a massive transgender debate. It's something we cannot be silent on. It is something that we cannot be silent on as a church. God made mankind with purpose and he made us with intention. John chapter 10, 10 says, The thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The enemy has always been at work in this area. This is nothing new to the human race. It's only new to us because our society has not had it to deal with in this magnitude in our lifetime. But now it's spreading like wildfire. And Jesus has already spoken about this. Matthew chapter 9. If you wonder, what, where, where does Jesus stand on, on these social issues that are just causing everybody to be polarity? Let me tell you, if you are a follower of Christ, if you are his disciple, you have already surrendered your right to make any changes to truth. You have decided that Jesus is the truth and whatever he says goes. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? There you go. I love you. I lo if you're struggling, if you know someone who's struggling, I love you. I love you. But you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Have you not read that who, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? There's a period right there. Okay. I don't mean to be condescending. I'm just telling the truth. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's a period right there. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Here God has clearly defined purpose and creation. Anything outside of this is against his purpose. I'm not saying this as a bully. I'm not saying this to demonize. I'm not saying this to, to, to be anything but a messenger of the gospel. It's just a truth, nothing more, nothing less. But the church cannot be indifferent to what is happening around us. We cannot cower in fear and remain silent on this issue and all of the other issues that are going on in our nation. We cannot remain silent. When it comes, and, and this is just one thing. This is just one thing. And, and, and let me say this for the sake of our children. We cannot be indifferent with agendas being pushed on our kids. 
okay? Biological men have no place in women's sports, in their locker rooms, or, their, or, or women's restrooms. They don't, okay? And for those of you who disagree with that, I love you, but if you follow Jesus, follow his words. Nothing more, okay? The church must also, though, lead with compassion. Because if we treat anyone who struggles with this like a gypsy is treated in Romania, then we are the sinners. So the church must lead with compassion as well, okay? Anybody that, that is affected by gender dysphoria, they deserve the love of Christ and the compassion from the church. Amen? Okay? We need to do our best to be the hands and feet of Christ. And this is a sensitive issue, but you have to understand. I started in youth ministry in the year 2000, okay? I've been a youth pastor for a very long time. Kids today are, 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 are receiving an onslaught that I had never seen before, all right? Where every corner of the internet is plagued with people pushing agendas and pushing agendas. And if you are an educator in our schools and you live for Jesus, we applaud you and we honor you and we want to pray for you and we want to support you and we want to help you because you guys are on the front lines. And folks, we need to gather around them and say, what, what can I pray for you? How can I help you? How can I support you? Because our public schools are the battlegrounds right now. I mean, recently, oh, I can't go into that. Many of our youth today who don't struggle in these areas are being groomed to explore it and be deceived by a society that is indifferent to the purpose and word of God. Pornography is more accessible than any other time in human history. Anyone, anyone, can access anything that they want. And parents, I need to just, you, you cannot be indifferent to what your kids watch. You cannot be indifferent to what your kids listen to. You cannot be indifferent to who influences your kids because if you don't influence them, I guarantee you Satan will. Grandparents, you cannot be indifferent to what your children allow your kids, your grandkids, you cannot be silent. Empty nesters, you have to invest in the lives of kids that you are not biologically connected to. Church, we have to do a better job. Dakota is doing the best he can in our youth ministry, all right? As our youth minister, he's doing the best he can. There are some young men that need small group leaders. There are some people that, that need discipling. They need, we need some men to help out in that area. We cannot be indifferent to it. We need help to raise these young men as a community of faith. These young ladies are extremely impressionable. And there is a battle for them that we need to engage in, in prayer and support and help. These young girls need small group leaders to help them. And I'm pleading with you, don't look at them as somebody else's problem. Feed Christ by feeding them. Love Christ by loving them. Take them into your home as you would take in Christ. Because if you do it to our youth, you do it to Jesus. And I encourage you, wrestle with that. Don't be indifferent to it. Well, I've already raised my kids. Okay, good for you. Do a little bit more raising because God's not done with you yet. And I don't want to get too political here. I really don't. But the big reason we are, we, we are where we are in this nation and the society struggles is because the church has become way too seeker friendly and stopped having the courage to say and teach what Jesus instructed to say and teach because it is offensive to the world. I realize I just, some of you are already turned off to me and you're done. I get that. I get that. Here's what I want to do. If you are absolutely repulsed and offended at what I've just talked about, Please, please come talk to me face to face. Let's sit down with the word of God and let's reason together because that's the way Christ would want it to happen. Amen. Don't just leave angry. Let's reason together because there is truth. There's absolute truth and it is pinned by the hand of God himself. 
In that little video we saw, a dirty little girl walk through a restaurant and the customers were inconvenienced by her presence and her problems and they wanted her to go away and they wanted somebody to usher her out. We saw that. And many of us suffer the same ills. We decline the godly opportunities. And as morality in our society is challenged, it is an inconvenience to us to speak up. We don't want to engage. We don't want to speak up or make a stand because we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the one who can set our hearts free, and he will allow people forgiveness, salvation, and purpose. And we cannot stand by silent, and we cannot be indifferent. Some of you need to run for political office. Some of you need to get involved in your community. Some of you need to work in social services. Some of you need to become educators in our public schools. Some of you need to do something because all of us are called to serve, right? And be the hands and feet of Christ. And I'm calling us to no longer be indifferent to what is going on around us, even though it is going to cause us to have a target painted on us and the world is gonna come after us. But Jesus loves everybody, doesn't he? And Jesus wants everybody to be free, doesn't he? And we sang a song, let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. That's true. He's done it for me. Other people need to hear it. But in order for them to hear it, we cannot remain indifferent. We must have courage. Amen. As the worship team comes, we're going to sing a closing song. My hope for us today is that we allow the Lord to uproot this stuff in our heart and to allow us to lay it down at his feet and say, God, I don't want this anymore. You've got to help me with it. Take the blinders off of my eyes. Put a rod of steel in my backbone. Allow me to have the courage and your grace to walk forward in your will. Help me, O oh Lord Jesus to do what you want me to do in every situation, to help the little girl that's dirty on the street, to help the man who's broken down on the car, to help the teenager who is being inundated with pressure to go in an opposite direction of the will of God. God, help me. Help me not be indifferent, but help me serve you by serving your people. Lord, whatever you wanna do in my heart, whatever you wanna uproot, do it now in Jesus' name. Let's respond to the Lord.